Hi, everyone here at the Earth Files YouTube channel in the United States and around the world, in Norway, Mexico, South Africa, Ireland, New Zealand, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Here are some UFO headlines from just the past week. March 28, 2024, airline passenger films flying saucer zipping past plane departing New York City. April 2, 2024, multiple UFO sightings over New York State leave witnesses stumped. Also April 2, 2024, amazing UFO sighting over Hudson River, New York, caught on video. April 1, 2024, Residents in Arizona, USA, captured footage of an unidentified sky blue object flying in the black night sky at 4.43 a.m. April 2, 2024, a woman named Sheila, living near Superior, Wisconsin, saw three lights in a triangular shape moving slowly above her property southeast of Grand Rapids, Michigan. She was walking out to her car on her way to work at 8.30 p.m. She heard something, looked to the south, and saw this huge triangle of lights in the night sky. She said it looked like it was going to land in the field, and then it stopped and hovered for a while before it took off and disappeared. Sheila of Wisconsin's whole sighting lasted only about a minute, she said. On March 28, 2024, the UK Daily Express headline, quote, nuclear power plant becomes UFO hotspot with 10 sightings in a single month at the southern tip of India. There are photographs of the UFO and the Qdonkulam nuclear power plant now being watched as a UFO hotspot for unknown reasons. The nuclear plant has been operational since 2012, and workers have noticed many UFO sightings above it since then. The recent UFO was described as, quote, flying in a peculiar zigzag pattern while emitting an intensely bright light across the night sky, close quote. And another eyewitness said, quote, I am more than 100% sure that what I saw were UFOs, the way it stood still, the way it made zigzag movements, and the speed in which it disappeared. They were all different, close quote. Then, this morning, Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024, came this disturbing headline in the New York Times, quote, Missile tested by North Korea is in range of U.S. bases. North Korea launched an intermediate range ballistic missile off its east coast on Tuesday, April 2nd, indicating North Korea is developing missiles capable of targeting American military bases in the Western Pacific, close quote. Also making news this week is the release of a new book entitled Nuclear War, A Scenario, copyright March 2024, and released on Amazon, authored by Annie Jacobson, a Pulitzer Prize finalist in the category of history for such books as The Pentagon's Brain, Area 51, and Operation Paperclip. In Nuclear War, she reports that if a Russian or Chinese missile launch were detected by United States technology, the U.S. president would have only six minutes to order a launch on warning retaliation to destroy the enemy missile. About that six minute launch on warning, Annie Jacobson reports that President Ronald Reagan said in his memoir, quote, how can anyone make a decision to launch nuclear weapons based on a blip on a radar scope, close quote. When nuclear weapons detonate, 300 mile per hour winds would destroy everything, Jacobson says, quote, you're talking about people miles out getting sucked up into the stem of that nuclear cloud. And so when you see the mushroom cloud, that would be people, close quote. 
Hundreds of millions would die in the first 72 minutes of nuclear war, she warns. Remember Benji in Melbourne, Australia, who described his encounter with a tall, white, non-human? I talked about it last year. I featured Benji in my Earth Files YouTube channel almost exactly one year ago on April 12, 2023. He was worried then about what was ahead on Earth's future based on warnings from the non-humans that he was communicating with. Well, this past weekend, I was able to reach Benji in Melbourne, Australia again. I asked him if he's had more communications with tall whites about this dangerous time on Earth and the revelation in Annie Jacobson's nuclear war book that an American president has only six minutes to decide whether to launch on warning or not. Six minutes, that is the window of operation that the president operates on when they get notification that has been launched. That's not a great deal of time. That weapon is not coming through Earth's atmosphere. That is actually going into orbit in order to come down. Say something was launched from Russia and it's heading towards the United States. What is your personal understanding from your communication with the Tall Whites about the geopolitical landscape of other ETs and who is collaborating with which human nation? The question that's burning in my mind the most is, who really is running this? Is it a human contingent? Humans being nasty to humans? Or is there an inhuman element in all of that, that something else there is? pulling the strings, whether or not there is actually a struggle there going on between who gets to manipulate the resource of this planet. It includes animal mutilations and human abductions. Yes, that's right. From my unique perspective, I've had encounters with multiple races. Now, one of the things that concerned me is that what if I was being visited by competing races at some point? On one hand, I've had encounters where the medical or and I've been taken and there's no information shared with me like an experiment. But then there are others where there have been shared information, showing me things in the craft which might be privileged. So I think that I must have had encounters with a number of different groups and it seems like it's some lack of hierarchy there, like the Wild West and, you know, we've got prospectors running all over town and there's no sheriff. And that sheriff might be somebody that's sitting within the military, thinks that he's putting himself in the middle of that, that if no one else is going to run this place, he's going to do it. Or well, they are going to do it. And that's why we probably can't get a straight answer out of everybody. It's almost like they want to keep us with an innocent mind about all of this. Well, the last time we talked in depth was in 2023. We're now going into April of 2024. And I had the distinct impression that you saw the tall whites as being extremely advanced, that they have the ability to go 50 light years in seconds because they know how to go into other dimensions and do cushion shots in this dimension. They can pop out into another dimension and pop back into this universe in a different place. Is that correct? Yeah, for an intergalactic civilization. When we think about extraterrestrial civilizations, we think of them having a planet. We have to move beyond that idea because they have the ability to create space stations and artificial habitations, and many of these beings can live without being actually on a planet themselves and living within these space stations. The tall whites have long had a base inside of Ganymede. Yes. And when you do remote viewing, do you get two-way telepathy with the Tall Whites? When I do remote viewing, it's very much like how Joe McMonagall describes it. You think through a glass darkly that once you've reached that point where your body is completely asleep, but your mind is active and you're in this very lucid state, then that's when you can get some very rapid fire vision. Hopefully, some of my questions will be answered. It troubles me that only a few months ago, I had the sense from several people in aerospace or others, individuals like you, 
that the tall whites were in fact in control. They would not allow any nuclear warfare, that the planet was just waiting for them to finally be introduced, and that in the end, we would all be able to feel comfortable and even good that there were these strong, tall whites that were helping us, allies, five or six months ago. Yeah. What has changed in these five to six months that everyone is concerned about what is going to happen and that there may not be a guarantee that the tall whites would stop a nuclear war. You yourself have been having these vivid dreams of what would be warfare. No doubt. If there was something with enormous destructive potential, action will be taken because we share this planet with them. The reason why they'd be concerned about what happens to us is that they were using it too. Our planet is like a hotel. There are tall white bases deep beneath the bottoms of the oceans and the seas. I've been told that the greys have bases inside of mountains in various places of the planet. The Nordics, they have bases. ETs have been paralleling the evolution of genetic experimentation with evolving primates into humanoids, i.e. us, and that this has been going on for a very long time, and that if we end up doing something that is destructive to life on this planet, humanity may be jeopardizing the planet. Yes. We understand that we are sharing this planet. You know, here in Australia, we have the threat of China bearing down on us right now. If they make moves towards Taiwan, then we have a big problem. We are so closely aligned with you. America and Australia, the same exact entity. We go where the Americans go. Feel that same sense of tension. And that the assumption that seemed to be being made only a few months ago in 2023, that the tall whites would not allow any nuclear war, nuclear launch, the tall whites are essentially protecting humanity from itself, something may have changed. This is all my intuition that there is a new weapon. We're talking a lot about energy weapons. What if it isn't a country? What if it is just a rogue actor? What if it's an organization? If you've got a good team of hackers, you can do all sorts of things. So I wonder whether or not the idea of warfare being Something that is hardware is also crossing over into the world, digital software, malware, all of those kinds of things. It makes the landscape a little bit more tricky. Have you ever talked with a tall white about whether they are physically based underground at Pine Gap? They come and go. Dating back even to the time of the Aboriginals, they used to see them back then too. So I wonder whether or not there is an underground facility there that they've had, something that goes back to ancient times. Right. We've got cave caverns, and there's even underwater reservoir underneath the Northern Territory. The water down there is equivalent to something like the, um, the Mediterranean. So what we don't understand what's going underneath our planet, that it will be hopefully jointly protected. That is my prayer. That is my honest hope. Mine too, and that's why I felt more comfortable last year in 2023 with the assurance from several sources that the tall whites were not going to allow any nuclear warfare on this planet because it would affect life forms that they are trying to protect. This is something that I feel if there's going to be an encounter that comes soon, that they might have a chance to communicate with me. I sincerely hope so. Many of you write me several times, uh, like in every month, about your hearing me talk about the thought that dwells in the light and that how profoundly I feel about how important it is to concentrate on that and to concentrate on positive frequencies to counter the negative. 
And if there has been a time on earth where it feels like if a lot of us could concentrate everywhere on the thought that dwells in the light, that maybe, maybe it would help change what feels like these negative energies that are trying somehow to take hold on planet Earth. And because we have been working so hard on so many different projects, I thought that it would be fun tonight on the 3rd of April to get Brad to get out the four minute bell and that I am ready to open up, take your questions and want to bring Ian in now as my dear chocolate wants to entertain us. <laughs> He's so wonderful and beautiful. Ian. Hi, Linda. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> yes. So right off the bat, I have uh, Rob Bob 5318 who has been asking this question for a few weeks, but I have put it by. It's a very important question. He says, uh, Linda, did the cattle mutilation stop? And if so, why? And uh, I just want to preface that because I know when you did the strange harvest in 1980, that uh, a lot of people thought that the cattle mutilations had uh, finished that started in the 1970s. And you said that if they hadn't finished, they'd just not been reported so much. Well, and the mutilations go back to reports in some parts of the world, like Australia, to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, there are a lot of other reports that I have had in historic files that went in the, in the 50s. Uh, when I came into it for the first time in 1979, uh, and that was because uh, ABC Network in New York uh, was uh, trying to do a story for the new 2020 news operation about bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. And that my camera crew on another project, uh, my audio guy, had been on that 2020 crew and was telling me about how the batteries uh, the batteries for the equipment out in the field, and they were out in Kansas and various places in the Midwest, it would, the, they had no charge. And that was what originally caught my attention, is what would have blocked uh, the power uh, from something that everybody depended upon with your life uh, when you were in television and you were in production and you needed those batteries to power your equipment. So what was it that was interrupting? Well, that question came up even when later, when I had started working on what became uh, the Emmy award-winning film documentary, A Strange Harvest, and that my first shooting with the crew was in October of uh, 1979. And from 79, and then it broadcast on May 25th, 1980. The sheriffs, uh, the uh, Colorado, uh, it was like a CIA office. Uh, the, the officials that I got to talk to and see their files, hundreds. I think that Sher Sheriff Tex Graves showed me something like 228 just in his office alone. So we're talking about over uh, 10 years, uh, over perhaps 2,000 cases in a state in some places. So it never was a small scale phenomenon. It just came in different cycles and waves. And right now, um, I have a fascinating story that I am hoping that I'm going to be able to connect with the owner of a beautiful white bovine in Australia uh, that was found classic, uh, pure white, dead and mutilated in Australia. And I have the contact information, but when I have called the phone number, which often you're trying to match the time between uh, here, it would be mountain time in the United States with them in Australia. I still have not been able uh, to get a hold of them. They may be traveling, but that was a recent case in which I got the newspaper uh, story from Australia, and I'm now trying to follow up. And it made me wonder if this beautiful white animal in Australia is a current mutilation, could it signal that as we come out of the spring into the summer and the fall of 2024, are we going to have more rashes? 
Well, for all of you in all of the countries, I did the list at the top because Ian has been keeping track and it's wonderful to feel that there are so many uh, countries and so many of you. If you hear of something about a bloodless, trackless animal mutilation, um, let me know by email or uh, mail if you think that that's better. Sometimes it's good to send me local newspaper articles that have photos of whatever is described as a, a mutilated animal. Um, and then I've seen, I've seen so many. Um, I can tell a lot even from a grainy black and white newspaper uh, article. So um, right now, I think for everybody, I would say that animal mutilations are a harvest, and they are a harvest of fluids and tissues and sperm and eggs on two parallel tracks, the ones that we call the animal mutilations that are bloodless and trackless. They're very neat. That's one of the things that separates them aside from predator or anything else, is one category of harvest. And then there are humans who are in the abduction syndrome who might have sperm taken, might have eggs taken, might have a triangle of skin. And that's where there's a huge difference. The humans are handled differently from the animals. And as we are now going into the middle of 2024, and we don't know what is going to happen with the heat and all the fire warnings that are beginning to emerge in a lot of places in this summer. But it is possible that we could be going into another cycle where there will be this harvest. That's why I called my first TV documentary A Strange Harvest, because after working with a crew, traveling in all of those ranches, uh, photographing so many of the bodies, talking with uh, veterinarians, and talking with so many ranchers. It was just so clear to me that this was a harvest. It was a harvest. And eventually, uh, leading up to discussions with other people who were in the abduction syndrome, like Bud Hopkins and Whitley Strieber, uh, they tended also to agree with that perspective. And what I think the whole world would like is to understand the whole truth. If there is a harvest of genetic material that has been ongoing on our planet since at least the 20th and the 21st centuries, what exactly is the application? What is the need? Is that continuing a genetic manipulation experiment somewhere else? And these are sort of the jump off points where we are now at a, I think, I hope, that we're in the year that might finally be leading up to some sort of a honest statement. Some people are saying it'll be 26 or 27. Others are saying it will be done by 2025. Well, at Earth Files YouTube channel, I'll keep trying to present as much data as I can as we lead up to what should be the declassifying of Earth's reality and finally telling the truth about the relationship of Earth to many other intelligences, at least at this end of the Milky Way galaxy. Now on that note, and Brad standing by for the bell, I'm going to segue to Ian in England to line up the first question, and I will try hard to have an answer completed in within four minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Uh, I, I'd just like to say that I tracked a, uh, a mysterious horse mutilation in England in December 
last year. So, you know, it is yeah. still going on. And that was a horse that was uh, missing an, an ear and genitals as well in strange circumstances. Uh, so I think it is still going on. I've got a question here from, um, well, it's not a question, it's a comment from Michelle Tech and Tecklenburg from obviously from South Africa it says I see cloaked spaceships leaving Table Mountain in Cape Town. Yes, I saw I think a story you probably sent it to me about that and the appearance and disappearance of the lights or craft depending upon the shape. I think that that has been one of the observables that have been reported as much as anything else by humans over the many decades of seeing things that are there and then they pop out or there's nothing there and then they pop in. And I think that the category, that that's a technology category and paralleling it is another technology category uh, that I call the shape shifting by the non-human intelligences. And probably both uh, the technical craft in the sky and the surface ability to manipulate and shape shift, that they may both relate to the high, high civilization that has the ability to work in subatomic particle level, whether they're adjusting the surface of something so that it changes from looking like a uh, standing up alligator to a blonde woman, or it is a technology of something in the sky that may look like it's round or cylindrical, and suddenly people will see it shift into another pattern and take off. That is a long time uh, description context for describing the, the biology and the technology of what I think are advanced technologies by other advanced intelligences and that being able to control the subatomic world is also part of their shape-shifting. And I welcome any and all technical people, engineers, scientists who may have first-hand information about the subatomic particle manipulation by ETs that I know we have studied and, st and may or may not have enough help to do it, and that uh, I would like very much to be able to keep reporting information from those of you who are, uh, you don't have a question at all that we are dealing with advanced extraterrestrial intelligence. Okay, Ian. Okay, here's a question from Daniel Bradshaw. Uh, Linda, I live in Idaho and most of my life I've been following your research along with a few others, but I'm curious. Where is the mountain that you're talking about where you had a strange encounter or a strange experience? And have you ever been back there? It's a very good question. It was the Salmon River, Johnson Creek. It's a tributary. And if you look on a map and you in Idaho and you see the Salmon River, uh, some maps have this little tributary that comes out called Johnson Creek. And that was where my father, who was director of aeronautics for the state of Idaho, Chet Moulton, he had build an airport in a day programs. And we as kids would go with mom and dad for one of these uh, official Idaho build an airport. And one of the places that my dad liked going the best of all was to Johnson Creek Salmon River, sometimes to fish, sometimes to hike. And uh, there were not lots of people, but there were a few, and my dad knew some. And so my brother and I ended up doing a lot of uh, backcountry, uh, I guess you would say, exploring and, and flying in and out of new places with dad who would come back to the airport that was built in a day. My brother and I, mom and dad were there when the Johnson Creek Airport was built. Now jump forward in time 
that I now am graduating from high school and I would like to have uh, college scholarship money. And they, you've all heard it, I'll just, I went into the pageants and ended up in Atlantic City in the Miss America pageant and got enough scholarship money to put me through uh, four years at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And in the process of getting ready for uh, uh, the pageant, one of the things that summer before uh, my college started in the fall is that I asked dad to fly my brother and a cousin and me back into that Johnson Creek airstrip that's near the Salmon River run. And there is, uh, I have photographs, I know I have photographs of this area. And you, here's the airport and then it starts climbing like like this at the at the one edge of the I think it would have been the western edge of the airport and then it starts going up higher and higher and that's what I was climbing every day those two weeks uh, before being in the pageants and it was at the getting to the top what that whether it had anything to do with the physical exertion I don't remember physical exertion. I was always a strong runner, a strong, I did, I did not uh, weaken very easily. So I don't remember anything like that. It was clearly light that was outside of me, outside of the environment. It, it was uh, light in an orange, uh, very I can see it in my eye, mind's eye. Um, hard to even say exactly because it glowed and it glowed in such a strange fashion that to say that it was a color is not doing it justice either, but it was orange. And the next thing that I know, I, I'm walking toward it. I don't remember any fear. I don't remember any confusion. I don't remember having thoughts beyond what is this orange light doing? And then I'm at the bottom of the mountain. And that's the part that is so eerie. I do not know how I got from the orange light at the top, it was more like a beam to the bottom. But when I did everything flowers, everything was pulsing light. And the first evening stars were pulsing light. Everything that seemed to have a, a glow to it in, in nature was pulsing. And to finish out for those who have not heard this, and with deep respect for my colleague, Brad and the four minute bell, I'm just going to finish something in all of that, felt like warm jello. I felt my hands being pulled up in front of me. It wasn't me doing it. It was warm and jello, and I experienced the same thing many years later in a crop formation in England, same thing. And it is a thought voice, clear, neither male nor female. It's just a clear thought voice. You are one with the light. The light is one with you, and you're in the hands of God forever. And then everything reestated. All the flowers went from pulsing. Everything went back to normal. So to come back to your question, it's the Johnson Creek Airport on the Johnson Creek in the Salmon River complex in Idaho. It was incredible. It's like something gave me a great gift. Okay, Ian. Sorry, Linda, I, I might have missed that. Did you actually, have you actually gone back there as well since oh, then, Linda? I don't think that I have physically been back at Johnson Creek um, 
at least it would have been, if I was, and you don't remember everything clearly in your life, it probably would have happened uh, in my college years. And why that would be blurry is that I ended up at the University of Colorado and then I worked in Washington, uh, D.C. for Senator Len B. Jordan of Idaho. And then I went to Stanford in California for two years uh, making documentary films in medicine and science uh, for my a master's degree. And so there was, there was less home travel back to Idaho. But I think later on uh, that my brother, I know we did, my brother and my then husband and I decided that we were going to go back to Idaho into a very specific place. Um, and it was, it, we went back probably to Johnson Creek. And what is interesting, I think you would expect that I would want to walk the same hill mountain and get to the top and see what it would feel like. And I climbed a lot of mountains in that Salmon River with my brother and my husband and sometimes with other friends at different times. But I never ever stood in that Johnson Creek Airport looking up at the mountain and saying, I wonder if that thought voice would come back if I walked it. So it's almost like something was completed on that day back, which would have been around 1963. That's probably when I was there, approximately. Okay, Ian. Well, Linda, um, several people are commenting about a video that, that's out recently where you're talking about perhaps a previous past life in Egypt. Tracy Murray says she watched the video and it makes sense in her opinion. Uh, were you regressed and uh, have you been regressed or would you consider being regressed? I have never been regressed about Egyptian impressions that I've had. And I only was there once in matter form. And that was, I remember very clearly, was uh, 1982. And I was married. I have my daughter, Laura. We had a a lovely home in Denver uh, on a creek. I've always loved being near water and a creek. I loved it. And I still, like, why do some of these memories have such vivid life in you? They never leave when billions of other things do. I have no idea. But right now, I can even feel what I felt that day in 1982 and I was looking at, I have always loved studying about Egypt. I have always been tremendously intrigued by hieroglyphs. And I had a book that somebody, by then, 82, I had done A Strange Harvest. A Strange Harvest had been broadcast May 25th, 1980. I began going to conferences. I began going to more and more and more ranches. I'm really into the animal mutilations. Extraterrestrial biological entities are doing the bloodless, trackless mutilations, but why? Is there a secret agreement with the government? Can I find people who have firsthand knowledge uh, who would be willing to at least uh, go on the record with me even if I had to protect them? That was my life starting with the innocence in 79 by March or May, May 25th, 1980, the broadcast. After the broadcast, it was like things exploded. Um, so by 82 and 83, uh, there were various things, but I'm trying to remember now um, that it, it, because HBO and a company in Los Angeles, I started getting other people who were very interested in the documentary that I had done, and they were sending me a tremendous amount of books on Egypt, Akkadians, Assyrians. I was beginning, the world was saying, look, 
the, the ETs are our ancient civilizations. That's where that concept, and on that one, this particular day, in that house on that creek in Littleton, a suburb of southern Denver, I had such a book. I was looking at glyphs, and I feel right now, you're the first people I've ever told this to. I have never, <laughs> I have never shared this with anybody. But I'll keep on. I was suddenly flooded like a movie here and a feeling of tremendous anxiety, tremendous anxiety that caught me up short. And what this is, this is what the residue was left inside of me. You must go to Egypt now before it is gone. And I remember posing to my husband, I really would like to go to Egypt. Do you think that we could carve time? He was a corporate executive. Is it, it thinks there's a possibility that we could go to Egypt. And he was puzzled, but he agreed. And we went to Egypt as a, as my adventure, I guess, of what would I feel, why would that say, before it's gone? And on one of our excursions, we were there at the Winter Palace in various places for a week, I believe, staying in a local, some sort of hotel or something. And on one of the days, on the bus driving us down to the Nile to get us into um, one of the, if, if you were signed up to go out on the Nile and that they were being very careful that you didn't get in any of the water because of the organism that can get in your skin uh, if you touch the water of the Nile. And I wanted to at least feel what it would be like to be in a boat, a wooden boat again on water. And we ended up that day going, I think, we went to several places, but the one that I keep thinking that this question relates to, there weren't many people, and I don't remember why. I think I had asked if there was a part in Cairo where I could go and take photos and not be in front of or blocking the view of something I was looking for at the time that related to that book. So it was all kind of stitched together. And they were wonderful. And one of the guides took me to a very particular kind of like a plaza, huge plaza, that I didn't know existed. But there were all kinds of structures that were huge with women, all women carved. And I would learn that this was the hall of the women or female. But here's the other part that sort of seems like a, a bookend in a strange way to what happened in Idaho. I am standing on this big plaza. My husband Larry had gone off in another direction. He was looking for something else in another direction, so I'm there by myself. And I'm looking up at these carved women on top of these columns, maybe 15 feet high, and suddenly I just rose right up I went right up into the air. I was completely aware that I was in two places at once. For some reason, I wasn't scared. I rose all the way up to exactly in parallel at the same height as the carved women on the columns. And at that moment, and that may be what I've mentioned someplace else in a conference or here, it was, I was in 
two consciousnesses at the same time. Mine and one of those, even though they're rock sculptures. And there was something at that very moment that also seemed to segue over into everything I was dealing with having to do with animal mutilations, human abductions, advanced intelligences, and the question then that haunts me now. Why are we in a universe in which the black and the white always seem to be fighting each other? And it was probably at that point where I began scrawling on pieces of paper about is the whole universe, this one, that its whole evolutionary goal is for all that is in the light and that all of the thought that is in the light is what will eventually replace all that is dark in this universe. So all of these are kind of woven together in my mind and my soul. Okay, I know I'm going long over the bell, <laughs> but, okay, but I'm listening to myself, so I hope it's interesting. <laughs> Well, we're fascinated to hear these uh, these things coming from you, Linda. This is amazing. Uh, we've got Larry Looney who asks a very important question here. I used to go to Wright Patterson Air Force Base as a kid, third, fourth, fifth grades. I'm told I was in a secret competition. Linda, any information on such programs to recruit children with special or psychic abilities? And straight away, I'm going to say that Larry Looney isn't the only one. Whitley Strieber even wrote a whole book on on uh, on the secret school, which was his meetings with ETs as well. But he has his own experiences at Randolph Air Force Base. So there does seem to be some connection. Uh, yes, I have been uh, exposed several times to uh, all men. I don't know of a single female in this category, except maybe for me. <laughs> Uh, when I was at Stanford, it was very odd. I was approached by a man uh, who he didn't say, I want you to be on a UFO ET program. But I was approached by a man who said that they had been monitoring certain classes and that they wanted to know if I would be willing to, uh, um, I can't remember if they said take an exam or fill out something that they had questions and that I was curious and I decided that I would at least see what they handed me uh, to fill out. And uh, in the process, jumping, because I, eventually I learned, uh, they were a government agency um, looking for people who they thought had left brain ability to do fast read and fast translations. So that happened to me at, at Stanford. Jump back to the people I've interviewed, and I know Whitley knows about this and others, that if 47 is a line in the sand having to do with the Roswell headline finally being one piece that was honest about the UFOs and, and all, uh, then 47 might have been the line in the sand for the United States government to also start, I'm going to say looking, testing, but not in an obvious way, for people that they thought might be able to handle telepathy. Because there's no question they, were, they knew that they were working or, or around, uh, the gray beings were telepathic, um, my understanding is that the tall whites are largely telepathic, whether or not they also can speak a language, but that the advanced civilization represented in interactions here on this planet, they all seem to be telepathic. We humans, as the Anunnaki appeared to uh, express dismay about, we're noisy, we, we make noise, we talk and 
whether or not uh, the government has volumes or who knows wh what they have, it would relate to what do we need in humans to communicate with extraterrestrial civilizations where they are largely telepathic and we talk. And I think some of these efforts have happened in schools and that they were presented as a contest, they were presented as a competition. And at least I've talked with, I don't think uh, more than four, I've talked with I think four individuals, all male, who whether it was grade school, junior high, I don't think anybody had this happen when they were in actual high school ready to graduate. It was mostly uh, junior high and, and grade school. So that's my guess, that, that it was the government looking for people who might have the ability to do telepathy. Now, I would welcome hearing from any of you who have had this approach. And I made one. I got one. Four minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, we've got people. We've got people in the uh, chat tonight. C. A. Beaver Forden says I had a female friend that was in the special program during the nineteen fifties from Pittsburgh. And also, Josh asks. Also says I also had a similar experience. A field trip in middle school for contest winners. Very small group of us. Feels like an implanted memory. Uh, I also have a memory from uh, when I was at primary school. Uh, of a small group of us being taken suddenly without any notice to uh, a separate hall away from the school to do tests where we were also asked to look at uh, sequences. And I think there was a time element in all that as well. Well, if I so. may just add, because uh, this is provoking parts of my mind and brain that I haven't thought about for a very long time. Um, in of what would have been around 1986, I believe. Um, I wanted, I, I had been very focused on things Egyptian and wanted to know everything about Akkadian and Anunnaki and all of that world I wanted to know. But I was being introduced through the work that I was uh, investigating the ET factor in animal mutilations and human abductions and earth history and World War II was an extraterrestrial war fought through human bodies. All of that was, was really uh, getting into like a labyrinth. And I wanted to go to Peru. And I decided that perhaps the safest way uh, to go to Peru uh, would be with some group and uh, I found one, and it was like six of us uh, putting in a certain amount of money for somebody to take us around. And, and I wasn't, I didn't have a, any kind of an agenda beyond having read Shirley MacLaine's book, Out on a Limb. But there was something that was really drawing me about uh, Peru and its relationship to everything. And one of the things that people mentioned was, if you're going to go to Peru, you need to go to Coariti. It's in some spellings, K-O-Y-U-R-I-T-I, Coariti. And it is a gathering every four years on the top at 22,000 feet in one of the Andes. And interestingly, where I was staying as an American with this small group uh, in Cusco, um, they were very interested in Coyoriti and showed me some photos and said not many people ever can go there from the gringo land of the United States, they can't put up with it. And that really intrigued me. And I said, I'd really like to know more and ended up getting assigned because I decided I really want, I, I wanna see this Peruvian festival at, can I go up to 22,000 feet? And I say that 
sort of lightly, but that was sort of the way I felt at that time. And long story, on horses, horsebacks, going up trails that seem like this, having a horse stumble, and literally, we're not talking about anything paved. There's nothing constructed. We're talking about maybe 30 people in a line of 30 horses with minimum saddle, blanket, and rain, N absolutely nothing else, no supplies, nothing. And my horse, which, you know, you can feel intuitively some animals, you just love them and they love you. And I felt that way with that horse from the moment I got on it. And suddenly, as we're going up this, just it's trail because the horses had gone on this, and you're looking straight down to a big river creek. And I don't know exactly how high we were on that horse trail, but what I do remember to this moment is the horse stumbled. And I literally am falling I'm looking straight down on this river that looks like it is straight down from where we are, a thousand, two thousand feet up. And the, it was like when they, the, your, your life flashes in front of you. I had something like, oh my God, I'm going to die here. And the horse, I have no idea how it did it. The horse seemed to lunge. It, the horse lunged right to the wall, which was only three feet away. But that horse seemed to understand the whole situation. And as it lunged, it lunged right up against the wall. And there was a mother and a child who couldn't have been more than two years old. Right, we, we could have smashed them. And in that moment, I'm looking at the two-year-old, the mother, the horse is crushed up against that wall. I'm still hanging on. And the one thing, because something had happened to the reins, that I didn't have leather, I just grabbed a hold of this horse's hair, the reins. I held it. I just held it. And the, it was like we were frozen in time. The two-year-old, the mother, the horse against this wall that was only three feet away and me hanging on to its hair. And in Peru, and I, yeah, Brad is saying I'm at the end of my, not only the bell, but the end of the time. <laughs> oh, and that I'm grabbing onto my microphone. <laughs> that, that in that moment, of all of those ingredients, suddenly everything went from, this is the end. Like everybody was caught frozen at the end. And then I think it was this beautiful deer horse. The horse lunged again, going straight, not against the mother and the child, as if the horse itself understood the only thing that's going to get us out of this is him. And that horse lunged forward. And by the time I got up to the top of that mountain, and I was with four men in me, uh, two of them were Peruvian, that the four nights that I was at the Coriti Festival and learned what the goal is at that festival. It is to redeem and expand and evolve your soul. And I only learned that from some of the Peruvians who were there. And when we sat up one night around a fire, cold, 22,000 feet, I learned that I was able to go in and out of 22,000 feet, go down low and come back. I'm going to risk the wrath of the timekeepers because I want you to just know one more, one more incredible thing. I was there at Kororiti 
there were only, I believe the count was 11 gringos that were not Peruvian. And the 11 were from the United States, and I was one of them. And I never saw in all of my life before or since true humility, as was in the people gathered at that 22,000 foot mark. To go into a church literally built out of stone by a mysterious person, various mysterious stories about how it happened. And inside of the church at night, people would gather and they would have candles, little ones, with fire burning in between their fingers. And I saw how the, their fingers were turning red with burns because they chose to keep the candles burning in their fingers even if it was burning their flesh. And I think that Kororiti ended up giving me a sense of a relationship between soul and the thought that dwells in the light more deeply than perhaps anything. And that this is the odd part. I've told you the a little bit of the spiritual. If that was 1986, it was only five years ago. We're at 2024, so this would have been right at the, yeah, I think it was four, it might have been 2020, it might have been four years ago, but not very long. I get a call from somebody who says, I've seen you on a conference or I've seen you on TV and I know you and I know you from when you were at Stanford University. May I take you to lunch and tell you something that might be very interesting? And this man, probably in his early 70s, we meet, he said, when you were at Stanford and he had a story where we had met, he said, you didn't know I was working for the Central Intelligence Agency. No, I mean, yeah. He said, and I want you to know that you have puzzled us. You have really puzzled us. We were tracking. I was in a unit and we were tracking you because of the work that you were doing, which was animal mutilations, extraterrestrials, and all of that. And he said, somebody decided that when you made a choice that you were going to go to Peru, that you were going to go to Coloridi, well, we decided we would follow. And I want to know, on the day that you tried to go up to the ice, that level was above 22,000 feet. And we watched you get down on your hands and knees. And we saw you crawl on your hands and knees to an altitude. Linda, most people would be unconscious. Did you do high altitude training before you went to Colorado? This is what he wants. I said, no, 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 I never even thought about it. I figured that I, if I was going to go, I would be fine. And I was fine when I walked back from, he showed me a photo. They were photographing me. And he said, I have been training mostly men on this planet for most of my career with the government to go to high altitude locations and survive. Linda, you didn't even have oxygen. I had no idea I was being monitored. I had no idea that whole time I was in Peru that some government agent pretending to be a Peruvian, I had no idea. But when he got through telling me how many things I did that nobody is ever supposed to be able to do, just like in Egypt, 
just like in Johnson Creek. This is a life that has embedded in me a tremendous connection to the thought that dwells in the light. I really do feel you, I, humans, we do have souls. And the souls are capable of doing so much more than we are taught. And I hope that my doing the Earth Files YouTube channel, my books, my documentaries, conferences, radio, television, if anything comes from my voice or my energy to you and gives you a sense of hope beyond a world that seems to be slowly going insane, remember, concentrate on whatever feels right to you, the thought that dwells in the light that is our ally. I Linda, love you guys. Ian. Linda, before we close eyes, uh, that was amazing. And I know we've gone over time, but I just want to uh, let everyone know about your upcoming conference oh, yeah. appearance at Contact in the Desert 2024. And I'm going to post the links in the chat and in the uh, bottom of the video tonight. Thank you. I love the guys I work with. I love all of you. It's wonderful that we are continuing to climb in subscriptions. We're getting up close to 270,000, uh, which is really thrilling. And uh, let's just keep going and evolving together and pray, concentrate in your mind on obliterating by blocking out, by evaporating any thoughts any fears of something as horrible and insane as nuclear war. Don't let it happen. I love you guys. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC, and then select auto translate. Select a language Bind them anywhere. They love and the captions that. will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.